Hallo, Theresa Schubert. Hi, I'm really happy to present a talk by Theresa Schubert. And uh, let me just give you a small introduction how I got to know you and uh, the work you do. Um, this year in pandemic, I was also, I, I found this new hobby. And I, I went to gather mushrooms and, and forage around in the forest. And, and actually, I looked uh, if other people are doing the same thing or I kind of stumbled uh, into an exhibition that you did because you are a media art artist, um, you, you fuse uh, media art, you, you fuse science with your art and what you did and what you were showing was, um, it, was a, it was an installation, it was something that you did and what you did is, I think you're going to talk about it in the talk as well, uh, you took mushrooms and uh, you exposed them to different sounds and you cr created this uh, immersive installation, You'd, it was uh, interactive and that was the thing that amazed me as well because I was standing in front of a screen and I could play sounds to mushroom and see how the mycelium uh, was growing and it was really amazing and it looked amazing and I just wanted to know more about what you do and, and that's why I invited you to give this presentation and I'm really excited to, yeah, to listen to your talk. So have fun, that's me. Thank you for the introduction and for having me here today. Um, yeah, as mentioned before, I'm a media artist by education and uh, through chance and curiosity, I got in touch with a very special forest organism exactly 10 years ago. And since then I have been working with moist media in my art and in my research. I just finished a postdoc at the Bauhaus University on the technical reproduction of meat and the usage of the human body in bioart. And for the past two years, I was artist in resident at the research project Mind the Fungi between the TU Berlin and Art Laboratory Berlin that just ended with a publication. Coming back to this forest organism that I met 10 years ago, you might be familiar with the extraordinary slime mold Fusarum polycephalum, the many-headed mold. This creature usually lives in our forests and you can see it on decaying wood or leaves after the rain. It is the largest single cell organism known on earth, belonging to the species of protists, not molds or fungi like many people believe. I became aware of it through this study by Japanese scientists that was published in 2010, um, where they were using slime mold to model the transport system. The way the experiment worked was that they um, inoculated, they put the slime mold on the center of Tokyo and put food sources for the spots where the train stations around Tokyo were and then observed over time how the slime mold was connecting the different train stations together through its own body network. And then they compared it uh, with the actual railway system map around Tokyo and they found that there were big correlations between the way that slime mold connected the food points and the real railway system was. I did more research and I found this great book by Andrew Adamatsky called Fizarro Machines from 2011, where he showed a lot of examples with geometrical computation with Fizarro. And he also mentioned how in different, different stages of its life, Fusarum resembles at first a decentralized network and second moves on to a rather distributed system, which is also interesting to look at. I was so intrigued by this seemingly smart blob that I decided to get my own and start experimenting. I had the chance to do so during a residency on a boat in Linz, Austria in 2010. And since then, for the next five years, this little organism became something like a pet for me, but also a collaborator in my artwork. Because I had no formal education in biology or such, no laboratory access, I got in touch with the DIY bio movement. Especially, I would like to mention the Hecateria platform, where the colleagues are also present um, at the Congress, actually, for the past few days. And also a top lab in Berlin, which is a space where you can do um, bio lab experiments also under supervision of um, educated scientists. So I got fascinated after uh, many years of working mainly with the computer and uh, I was uh, excited to be working with my hands and with living beings. And in case of Fusarum polycephalon, 
because it's outside the aesthetic appearance and the morphology is also a manifestation of its mechanisms, its functions and reactions to the outside world. Over the next few years, I did a lot of experiments. Some are more ironic, some more simple material experiments, some with a more scientific mindset and some developed into even larger conceptual or interactive artworks. I did experiments um, on more architectural surfaces, experimenting with cubes, with different media uh, to grow the physarum on. I experimented with color, trying to change um, the color of uh, the organism through ingesting different pigments or dyes into it. I did some more aesthetic or ironic things, growing it on the structure of a brain, looking, uh, comparing the networks of the slime mold. Um, I inoculated it uh, on a sheet of paper, mapping uh, Arduino board with food where the uh, electronic components in the board are and looked how what cable connection Fusarum would grow. Um, I did a Fusarum clock. I experimented with variables and jewelry and glassware. And then I came across this um, quirky scientific experiment that was done in 1948 uh, by a zoologist and a pharmacologist. And they were looking to investigate the influence of drugs on the nervous systems of humans. And as a model organism to work with, they chose the spider and they fed the spider uh, different kind of drugs. And then what I found particularly interesting was that they didn't look at the behavior of the spider on drugs, but they looked at the product that they were doing. So at the webs that they were weaving and how functional the webs were in still catching flies, meaning ensuring the survival of the spider through this. And um, I found this approach quite interesting um, and translated it a little bit in an abstracted form to Fusarum polycephalum and fed a variety of um, plant-based calming uh, substances uh, to, the, to the slime mold, such as uh, valerian, St. John's word, tobacco, but also cannabis and compared the different morphology and network structures that the organism was growing when it was cultivated on these different substances and documented this in larger photographs and time-lapse videos. Um, I was then also particularly interested um, to look uh, at the membrane structure and being able to look inside the cell and I got in touch with uh, Professor Adamatsky, who was the author of the before-mentioned book, Fusarum Machines, and we started to collaborate on a bit of an ironic paper on uh, mapping or imitating the German autobahn with Fusarum and uh, making a small map where the slime mold would uh, grow, uh, would be inoculated in Berlin and putting food sources for the different cities or larger cities that are in Germany and then comparing it with the original map. And we also experimented um, with 3D printed terrains of Germany to see how it would actually behave if we are not dealing with a flat surface like it's usually done uh, with some kind of agar based media but actually having it grow over a 3D terrain. And um, after this I had the chance to join a research project uh, that was a European Union funded project specifically made for looking at slime mold computing, computing with biological substrates. And through this I was able to set up a DIY bio lab at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. And uh, this enabled also students of art and design to experiment with living organisms. This was back then, back then in 2013 I think. Um, a very special thing because um, usually art and design students don't have access to these kind of equipments.
in the video that um, I'm showing now, you can see microscopic videos of slime mold, um, but I captured only the very edges of the cell, so uh, where usually the organism starts to move uh, forward or backward. And um, when you look uh, very carefully inside the cell, you can see little particles moving and uh, they go in one direction and then they change the direction. And this happens at a very specific rhythm every 50 to 60, 60 seconds. Uh, Fusarum changes this flow of its cytoplasm and it's quite a regular oscillatory behavior. Um, it's called cytoplasmic streaming. And I found this very interesting to look at and um, was also applying another method um, trying to observe this further by building kind of very cheap uh, sensors through um, using aluminium type and uh, putting it into a device that was measuring the electrical potential, so the charge on the membrane of the organism. Um, and it was growing from, there was two agar blobs on the aluminium type and the organism was connecting the two blobs so that it would measure as precise as possible only the charge that was on the connecting tube, trying to eliminate um, surrounding noise. And I ended up with a lot of measurements that like look in graphs somehow like this and you can see that there is a movement, that there is a reaction to outside factors. Uh, this recording was uh, over two days or something like that. And together uh, with a sound artist, Leslie Garcia, um, we did a collaboration and translated uh, these data into a sonification. So we made the life of Fusarum audible over a specific period of time. After this, um, I developed a more conceptual work that was working with slime mold. It's an interactive um, video installation uh, where people can put their arms or other pieces of, uh, on this table and it's being scanned and the virtual organism, the simulation, looks for food on your skin and it recognizes food in darker areas. So when you have uh, hairs or wrinkles or moles or the space between your fingers or on your elbow or something like that, would be recognized as virtual food for the organism and it would then continue to grow and then later try to compute an optimum path to connect all the food points between each other. So you would get some kind of an alternative way of um, um, displaying or mapping your body through uh, the intelligence of a biological organism. So after all of these experiments with slime mold, I decided that it was time to move on to a new organism. And before that, uh, I started to do a lot of workshops here in Berlin, but also in other places around Germany and in other countries, where I was teaching people how to cultivate um, slime mold, mainly in an art and design context, also a little bit related maybe to architecture and um, and programming or computing work. So um, I started to cultivate a variety of fungi in my studio. Pretty much I started with just ordering kits that you can buy on the internet, that you can grow your own food mushrooms at home. And then went on also to try to uh, collect uh, fungi in the forest or in the outside and trying to transfer the cultures, uh, the mycelia cultures, into my studio. 
And then I developed a work uh, which is called Growing Geometries, Tattooing Mushrooms. And the title pretty much says what it is. I started to cultivate mushrooms and when the heads would come out from the substrate, I would tattoo uh, very simple geometrical forms in these heads and then observe over time how the geometrical forms would change due to the growing uh, fungi head. So uh, my idea was that um, instead of what you usually want on a human body is maybe to like keep the tattoo in the same shape. You don't want it to change really because you're getting older or maybe you're gaining weight or something like that. Uh, so the idea was the opposite, that the tattoo would actually get completed through an aging process maybe or through the growth process of the fungi as it kept growing. And um, yeah, there was a lot of experimentation with uh, trying to keep the fungi growing and keeping them alive. And um, I presented it for the first time then in 2015 at the Art Laboratory in a living installation where I tattooed the fungi for the opening and for the three weeks of the exhibition, people could go and see how um, they were evolving, how the forms changed. And I was tracking it also with a um, camera and making a time-lapse movie out of it so that people could actually see uh, the whole progress over time. Because the one difficulty that you have when you work with biomedia in art is when it's still alive in the exhibition, that whoever comes to see it, you usually only get a few minutes of this process. But the whole life cycle of the exhibition or of the installation, you actually never get to see because maybe, in my case, the exhibition is actually planned <coughs> for three weeks. So um, nobody will stay in the exhibition for three weeks. So you need to think of other ways how you can actually um, um, make uh, the translate this into uh, uh, the perception mode of a visitor. Um, yeah, these are some photographs that I did then from uh, the, also the, the time lapse um, and my studio experiments where you can see the forms tattooed onto mushrooms. And uh, I did from the time-lapse videos an um, animation where I took um, the photographs but then uh, only traced the tattooed forms and removed the rest of the image. So you end up with a pretty minimalistic video where you can see how circles or squares start to change and um, become more amorphous shapes. But uh, if you would only look at the video without knowing the context, um, you uh, would not really know um, how, how it was done or uh, what it actually, where it comes from. Um, also, I started to do uh, performative walks in the forest, um, the first time on invitation of Art Laboratory Berlin, where I went out uh, with a group of people and we were um, looking at fungi, but also at other forest organisms. Uh, we were looking at um, mycorrhiza, the mycelium that's uh, connecting between uh, the roots of trees and uh, the fungi mycelia. And uh, I was able to do this extensively then uh, through the Mind the Fungi project um, that uh, I started in 2018 and just ended and uh, together with uh, a group of uh, biotechnologists from the Technical University I did these walks around Brandenburg where I was also trying with small performative gestures to intervene the usual scientific approach so that our forest walks would become more than just a fungi collection exercise but also um, maybe trigger some kind of different perception or approach towards the forest, but also towards scientific tools. So I did these uh, temporary tattoos that you can apply on your skin with water. And they, um, they were small rulers. 
and uh, the people um, had to or were who wanted could put them on their skin in this case you can see it on the arm of a participant and uh, they had little collection bags that the scientists prepared and they needed to measure the size of it but then they had to apply uh, their body part their arm or their leg or wherever it was and thus get in touch literally uh, with the mushroom and with the environment but sometimes also work together in groups to be able to actually read what was on this ruler. And also I did some um, performative interventions um, inside the forest. Um, during this research project I also developed the work that uh, was mentioned before that uh, just ended uh, the exhibition at Futurium in Berlin. It's called Sound for Fungi homage to indeterminacy and I was looking specifically at how fungi would react to a sound when specific sound frequencies were applied to them. Ich habe gerade gehört, dass da kein Ton auf dem Video war. Da hätte natürlich einer sein sollen, da es in der Arbeit ja auch um Sound geht. Ich habe gerade gehört, dass da kein Ton war in dem Video, aber da hätte natürlich einer sein sollen, da es in der Arbeit ja auch um Sound geht. Das kann man aber auch im Internet finden, wenn man mich googelt. Und ansonsten, was ich vielleicht noch dazu erwähnen würde, ist, dass es eben nicht um Musik geht, also um eine Beschallung mit Musik, sondern tatsächlich habe ich spezielle Sinusfrequenzen getestet und die auch zum Teil noch in einem speziellen Rhythmus, also On-Off-Phasen, um zu gucken, wie diese Schallwellen den Klang beeinflussen und konnte eben tatsächlich feststellen in meinen Experimenten, die ich gemacht habe, dass es eine bestimmte Gruppe gab von Pilzen, die darauf positiv reagiert haben. Also in dem Fall bezeichne ich jetzt als positiv, dass sie schneller gewachsen sind im Vergleich zu denen, die eben in Stille kultiviert wurden. Oh, <lacht> sorry. <lacht> I, I realized I switched languages. <lacht> Um, um, yeah, in my experiments, I, I, I realized that there was a group of fungi that reacted positively 
to uh, the sound frequencies and with positive I mean that they grew faster and there was a smaller group that didn't like the sound at all so they preferred to grow in silence and with some of course I couldn't really find a difference between sound or no sound but also it was a very preliminary and at the end also artistic study and um, I also did some um, microscopic work to see whether I could see maybe through the microscope that the network of these fungi was maybe more denser or more loose or that the branching structure of them uh, was somehow different and um, yeah I was quite fascinated in general also by somehow yeah the beauty of the mycelia structures and maybe one thing while this video is still running um, the special thing about uh, about my experiment, but the Mind the Fungi project in general was that all the all the species of fungi that m me, but also all the scientists in the research group from TU used, were species that the people in our walks collected in the forest. So it was also like a citizen science project where. Um, people from Berlin and Brandenburg were able to participate by collecting the mushrooms and also going back into the laboratory with us and learning how to cultivate, um, how to make a clean culture uh, from fungi that you collected in the outside. Now I'm switching to a different kind of uh, work and organism. This uh, series is called a Milieu and it's a performance-based work series where um, I'm, I have a huge uh, petri dish that's 80 by 80 centimeters and I'm using my nude feet to make imprints. So what you usually do with the small swaps when you do a corona test, for example, I have been doing with my feet and I I did uh, walks at different places around Berlin with my nude feet and then imprinted them into this petri dish and compared over time um, the, the feet uh, that had collected all the microbes that were in the outside and on the other side also my own microflora, like my, um, my imprints of my feet on clean skin. So I did this comparison between environmental microbiome, microflora and my own and um, a series of photographs and also a video work where you can see how it's growing over time. And last I'm switching to my most recent project. Um, this is entitled Meet Me. And I was reflecting about the role that animals have in our society. And um, most of the time, animals are used for exploitation as products and materials or as stage animals. But um, most of the time, we use them for food, fashions, cosmetics, and science. So and many thinkers of the post-humanism stress a non-human centered perspective on the world and that we should assume a more modest role in our dealings with nature. So the consequence that I have drawn in the project is that if we see the human as an animal, then we should also be food or material. This is of course a provocation, but it's not science fiction or some morbid dystopia. It's a possibility, at least technically. Another background of this project was that according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, animal farming accounts for a significant share of greenhouse gas emissions and land use, as well as consumption of water and energy, and this will probably rise. So to solve or as a suggestion, scientists came up with a solution, which is the so-called cultured meat. Uh, which is basically taking cell 
culture samples from an animal and cultivating in the lab, incubating it, multiplying it, giving it nutrition, and then ending up this um, laboratory or in vitro meat that you can then um, produce, for example, a burger or sausages from, something like that. Dehumanism puts an end to the need to consider whether eating someone is socially proper or not. Those who choose to reject are free of moral constraints. No, no, no. Then, then, then can, can think. think. We can progress beyond a disembodied solipsistic ego and start to have a fair and just society for all. With modern biotechnology, it has become possible to grow new organs or tissue from our cells. Genome editing in theory allows us to construct a human as if it were a manual for a product. This has turned our bodies into a ground for engineering and to a certain degree made it reconstructable. In conclusion, I am treating my body as a material, an impersonal objective structure or architecture in the words of performance artist Stellak to experiment with. In the performance I am presenting the provocative notion of a biotech era cannibalism to raise awareness for issues around bioethics, body politics and the inhumane treatment of animals in industrial farming. Through new and weak meat production techniques, we could use our own body to feed ourselves. In addition, I wanted to elaborate on the idea of creating a mechanism for self-sustainable nutrition where the meat cells and nutritious medium comes from within yourself. Your body is an externalized production unit. Cannibalism is one of the big taboos left in our society, but it's left for apocalyptic, dystopian scenarios in popular culture, films, series, dark zones where we usually don't want to go. Historically, cannibalism was also used to justify the killing of the white western men of indigenous communities and to conquer new territories. Alleged cannibal tribes, for example on the Caribbean islands, were compared with animals. A human that consumes another human loses its humanity, it becomes animal, a beast without rights. 
I found the project uh, meet me and especially the live performance of the project to be really in line with my own research into ritualistic practices um, as well as issues of taboo and cannibalism being something that is taboo in, in Western society uh, but also cannibalism being something that was practiced in pre-Columbian uh, cultures to a point. Uh, I thought there was an interesting uh, parallel between these two approaches. The sounds themselves were reflecting what was going on in, in the performance and the actions on the piece. Uh, we also uh, employed like quadraphonic sounds, so the, the aspect of immersivity for the audience was quite important, and especially during the second movement where there is a dialogue between the artist and, and an artificial intelligence representation. For me and my artificial self, there is an odd feeling of uneasiness that is common to both when thinking about the growth of living beings or body parts and legs, as well as about artificial intelligence. Human beings that could put these visions of the future into practice, life, just got more peace, pluripotent, stem cells, aliens are invading along with the financial industry. I found a very interesting parallel between cloning the voice of Teresa, of the artist, and also the reproduction of the cells. So in one case you have the, the, the voice being a biometrical information that comes from the body, and on the other side you have the physicality of the cells. In a world where all life on Earth is a threat to all life and must be eliminated or reduced, this position is unchallengeable, and there is no disputing it. For nature, a truly wild world, ideals of free thought, quality, spirituality, self-determination, free health care, it's all fueling and games until you look at the sky, we would all be better off without all of this. We hate Mother Nature. We hate. We only see the destruction of something as if it were some kind of tribute to ourselves. You don't have to look so hard to see that there's nothing we were doing or willing to sacrifice to save Mother Earth, because we need her for our freedom and our health.
So in this performance, I was presenting the provocative notion of a biotech era cannibalism to raise awareness for issues around bioethics, body politics and the inhumane treatment of animals in industrial farming. I was also using my own body and literally like hacking or opening it up as a ground for the experiment and using my own, donating my own cells uh, for this meat and this photograph. You can see the petri dish uh, with uh, the muscle cells growing. It's approximately, uh, the petri dish is that size and the, the, the piece of the cells on the scaffold is approximately that size and it was like that high so that it was pretty much similar uh, to a burger patty, what you put on a burger. And uh, this was a little piece that was left over after frying. Um, in this photograph and this would bring me pretty much to the end of my talk and I would leave the rest of the time for discussion, questions uh, from the world. Uh, I put a few links and resources there from platforms, uh, DIY biology movements and biohacking groups that um, helped me along my way and yeah, thank you so far. Hello world, hello Teresa, thank you for your nice talk. Sorry for the technical difficulties, we will fix everything in post. Um, okay, let me st start out with this. I've got a couple of questions lined up. Mm. And um, to my understanding, and I guess that's what the audience also um, perceived, is that you managed to perfectly fuse the science part in your work, but also the, the art part. Um, you work a lot with yourself, your own body. Uh, how has the feedback been to your work? How has the wider audience reacted to what you present? <laughs> well, I think uh, you would need to uh, concretize this to specific projects because by now I have such a variety of projects. Uh, that span also back a long time. What I showed you now, some of the works are actually really old. <laughs> I don't really show them anymore <laughs> unless I'm really, really <laughs> asked to. But I prefer to show new works. And um, um, the slime mold works, for example, usually everyone loves because it's such a nice looking, interesting organism also. Even if you just look at in the Petri dish, it's a microorganism so you can see it. Uh, with your own eye, you don't need a microscope, it's not dangerous, you can like have it at home, etc. So that's usually very popular um, to, to show and to deal with. Um, something like my last project, of course, uh, where I'm using my body for uh, in vitro uh, tissue culture and uh, the creation of um, um, laboratory grown meat is something that's much more controversial. <laughs> And uh, obviously, <laughs> um, and I remember that um, in May, Dreisa did an interview with me, and after the show, uh, I got an email by somebody who was so offended uh, or disgusted uh, by the project that I now have a Wikipedia entry on the German page of Ekel Disgust. So, but that's, uh, for example, a rather, well, I wouldn't even say that that's a negative response because in somehow with this project, every response is a good response. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, clear that, it, that, that, there, that it will be edgy and like not something nice because it's not just dealing with pure aesthetics or something like that. It's actually uh, critical and a conceptual approach. Right, I, I think that people get that it's not just about the aesthetics and um, yeah, but let's say you want to you want to convey this larger picture, maybe different worlds, um, you do a lot of interdisciplinary work. Um, where do you find research partners? How do you find people that you want to collaborate with? 
In the best case, I'm invited, <laughs> and uh, then I just have to decide whether the project or the people interest me enough, and I agree. <laughs> um, in, in other cases, it might actually be that uh, it could be a specific call for a funding project, uh, a work that I didn't present because it's a purely video-based work. Um, I did last year through a funded residency program with the Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center in Poland. <laughs> and um, it was an immersive video production, for example. And um, I specifically applied to work with them. So they kind of hosted this residency program. We were looking for an artist. And I wanted to work with them and applied it. It worked out. So that's how it happened in another case. So it could vary. or. In the very first cases, uh, the, for example, the collaboration, the slime mold paper that I did with the German Autobahn to, together with Andrew Adamatsky, I actually contacted him because I had so many questions about the book that he published before, and then we did a few things together. So it could be everything. <laughs> um, is, it, is it easier to find people on the science side, or is it... Um, yeah, are museums interested in this? I mean, you, you exhibited in so many different places. You now talked about this video art in Poland. That's, that's again, something different. Um, who's, who, who's the easiest to, to approach? Who's open to these ideas the most, would you say? Hmm, I'm not sure. Scientists are usually very open to co collaboration. Then at the end, um, the, um, it depends what you want to get out of it because then when it comes to actually time that they need to input and if it's like their spare time then it can become very difficult but they're very open usually to discuss and share knowledge but for an actual real collaboration as we would talk about it in a more artistic context then it can be much harder because then they also want funding that gets along with it whereas maybe as artists and designers we're much more used to work on like a low budget level or something like that. Um, but um, also that I could not could totally categorize it. Yeah. Right. Um, there was another talk that was quite interesting about how museums are becoming more and more digital. Mm -hmm. um, Fortunately, you work with media art as well, which can maybe be translated or um, yeah, presented in a more digital or virtual setting. Um, now with the pandemic, this, this has been fast forwarded. Mm -hmm. do, you uh, do you see that um, your work will benefit from that? Will you go into more, uh, like an even more digital approach? Will you present or produce work that will take pla place in the virtual world? Does it affect you at all? <laughs> mm, it hasn't affected my work process or my works yet, um, but I am relying actually on real world engagement and physical spaces where I can work. So uh, um, obviously my studio, but that is independent, but maybe laboratories, then collaborations with scientists, Festivals, of course, are a big platform for me, which now don't happen anymore. The show I had at Futurium was uh, 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 ending before Christmas, uh, but the last yeah, nearly two months it was impossible to see it. <laughs> so in that sense, I mean, one might think that especially because I'm doing a lot of video work or simulations as well, that this might be very easy to just show online in a sense, which at some part is true. But um, because I also make installation and immersive media work that is actually much more sensorial or that builds on the spatial experience as well and the perception of your own body in space, um, that is something that you can also not uh, conceive, transmit through a screen because you still kind of want the space actually. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that as well. I was I wanted to ask you if um, some of your work. I know you did these walks where you took people along, or um, you you went outside to to look at different types of mushroom or molds. Um, I was thinking some some museums tried that and they tried to expand what they were showing and maybe make have people participate at home and and growing mushrooms um, is not that difficult. You yourself said you started buying all these mushroom starter packs. Um, would you 
do you see that there can there's like a field to be explored or what would you tell somebody if they want to grow mushrooms at home is that something they should do could do is it dangerous will there be mushrooms grow, growing all over how would you <laughs> what would you give them as a as a tip as a hint? That's so many questions sorry sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's because i also started growing mushrooms and i'm a bit afraid um no i don't think you have to be afraid um that uh, like like molds and fungi like uh, i don't know fungi that you have on, maybe on the wall or whatever they're totally different i mean fungi need different substrates and different nutritions so you can choose for example shiitake mushroom uh, it will only grow on a very specific substrate and even if you wanted it to it will never grow on your couch or in your bookshelf <laughs> But uh, oyster mushroom, for example, has a much broader spectrum. This uh, is something uh, you can see sometimes funny pictures how people actually grow it in their books and then the mushrooms come out from the book pages or something like that. Um, you can grow it with your used uh, coffee uh, from your espresso machine, for example. So it's also a great way to design circular economy and recycle within your own home. and. Um, well, my suggestion for people that want to try for the first time is definitely just buy an uh, inoculated substrate kit because it's like clean and you won't have to deal with a lot of contamination and it will be very successful fast. <laughs> cool, sounds awesome. Um, I have another question from the internet and um, it touches on something you said before now that we might go into a more virtual realm, but some of your work needs this kind of um, takes place in a certain space or needs this, I don't know if it's necessarily interaction, but or immersiveness. I'm, I'm throwing out some of these more art related topics. But um, somebody was asking if you have explored the field of intimacy, especially in the sense of um, multi or cross species work. I don't know if it necessarily touches upon what you did with your meat work. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, maybe not so much with the meat work. Um, well, one could say that at parts I did have an intimate relationship with slime mold because I worked with it so many years um, and sometimes very intensively, as I said at the beginning, doing it in my home, taking it on holidays when I was going away so that it wouldn't die, like, you know, having it, carrying it in my bag and feeding it or trying to find neighbors or friends who would feed it when I was away or something like that. So um, um, there definitely was a stronger connection than it just being a material that I used or something like that. Um, um, I'm not sure whether that's intimate enough. It wasn't erotic. <laughs> um, but uh, I know other artists who would apply <laughs> to that field. But um, yeah. Um, it also uh, touches obviously on the topic of, of ethics and emotional connection then because everyone who will start to experiment with living organisms, be it art or just simple fun fungi cultivation at home, you realize that this thing will die, yeah. especially in the beginning you have a lot of failure and uh, you need to find out specific methods and it's just uh, trial and error. And um, obviously then you come to the question, okay, the slime mold doesn't really have a brain, so you know, it's not really a big deal if it dies, but at the end, how can we allow ourselves to judge which organism is more, um, more useful, more intelligent or more versatile living, you know, is it a plant or I don't know, you know, so the, it becomes a difficult question when you, if you actually want to investigate it on an ethical level and a consciousness level. I, I, was, I was thinking of um, when you first start to grow plants that you kind of develop, start to develop a relationship to them as well. And uh, with molds and, and fungi, uh, um, they, even though they are as a species might be further away from us, you start to anthropomorphize them and, and yes, you are actually growing something and um, I, I kind of had that feeling that in some of your work, be it the tattoo one or um, yeah, different ones, it, it did touch or it did 
build this kind of relationship. And it was interesting to see that being explored. Um, where is, where, do you have an idea where you want to go with your work, how you want it to be presented in the future? Um, well, I don't want to miss real life <laughs> spaces, <laughs> only digital, I think would not work for us. And I think everyone who sees the massive amount of digital conferences that we are having or workshops, online workshops or whatever, online talks that we're having since spring, um, it has uh, advantages of, you know, being available so readily and at whatever time, but I mean, real life engagement, sitting next to a real person and looking into the eye, nevertheless, is an experience that you can't replace. And the same, I think, applies to art works. Cool. Then thank you very much. I think that's all the questions that we got so far. Um, is there is there any last words you, you want to present or how can people find your work? Um, just Google my name, <laughs> Teresa Schubert, and you will find me. Stay safe and healthy. And happy new year. <laughs> happy new year from us as well. The, talk, uh, the next talk will be in an hour. So see you then. Bye.